What's up guys, Evil Deer here. Now today I was planning to do a gaming video, but unfortunately my wife has cocked it out early and she's sleeping right next to my gaming PC slash editing PC slash everything, so I can't do any of that. So instead I've decided to do a video blog about something that um, has interested me for a while and also give you guys a little story about one of my travels. But first up, um, I've been reading this book, I just started kind of reading it again. I read part of it once before, particularly one chapter that seemed interesting to me, but now I've decided to start reading it from the beginning. Now, this book is called Racontoi el Omoto, and it was given to me by another Esperantist, um, and it's obviously fully in Esperanto. But I love these, this book on this particular religious movement, which is called Omoto, because there is hardly anything about it in English, but there's a ton in Esperanto if you can find it. Now, a motto, for those who don't know, is like a very small religious movement that exists in Japan. When I say small, it's still massive by like a number of people, but it's small as in percentage-wise to the overall population. Now, a motto has a very strong history with Esperanto. I believe it was like the second or the third um, Spirita Gviditino, uh, no, the Spirita Gvidantino, pardon me. Um, when I speak English and Esperanto just messes everything up, I'm gonna speak one language or the other. So the Spirita Gvidantino de Amoto, um, in 1923, what was her name? Um, uh, Onisaburo de Gucci, I've got it written down here, who recognized Esperanto as um, the main, like it should be used as the main tool for intercultural, inter-country communication type of thing, and kind of promoted it. And, there, and from that moment on, Esperanto has kind of massively grown with the Amoto movement, um, and it's got a very important place. It's like a spiritual type of language almost within the movement. So it's it's got a very, um, it's very ingrained in the actual religion itself. Now, this book here was written by a guy who's traveled to Japan several times, um, Roman Dobry, I don't know how to pronounce that, it's Polish, someone Polish pronounced it for me. Um, and he basically goes on about uh, what happened during his travels and he also interviews some um, Omoto um, adherents, I, sh I guess, and he spent like six months there at one point and he talks about how like if you were within the Amoto um, locations, like uh, for instance the Centro de Amoto and Kamioka, which is like the center for Amoto, um, th like there's signage in Esperanto that most of the people who have anything to do with the promotion of Esperanto, are, I mean the promotion of Amoto, are able to speak Esperanto. Most people are at least acquainted with the language, and a lot of them, a lot more than you would find in any other um, grouping, like religious grouping, actually can speak the language. And this is in Japan, mind you, so it's not exactly a European central country. So it really fascinates me, and I love reading this book. And I've, I've I read a, like one chapter on a particular Esperantist I liked um, uh, once a long time ago and then I kind of put the book in my bookshelf and kind of forgot about it. But you guys should definitely check it out because I've just started reading again and it's freaking epic. But it reminded me because this guy traveled to Japan and oh by the way just before I go into it, that there is my savior dictionary. This dictionary is freaking awesome for just quickly looking up words just in case you want to get one. Um, so. Yeah, it reminds me of my trip when I went to China because I actually stopped by um, Beijing and I randomly just decided to shoot an email off to, um, I think it was uh, China Radio Internacia, Chinese, um, Chinese International Radio. And I didn't think much about it, but one of the Esperantists actually responded and said, yeah, sure, come um, to this location, I'll pick you up. And it was funny because the whole time my missus is like, don't go there, you know, you don't know if they're criminals or what's gonna happen, they're gonna like abduct you and sell you to the mountain people or something like that. It was actually quite funny. But we just, I decided to convince her that, come on, let's just go to this location, they said, and we'll see what happens. So we went there, I remember we got off a bus and um, this young Chinese guy walked up to me and then in perfect, completely fluent Esperanto, basically said uh, Salut on me, no more estos, blah blah blah, and then he just started speaking away, and I was like, holy crap, this is this guy is speaking Esperanto with a better accent than me. And then I find out after a while that he actually studied Esperanto at university, and it was funny because during this point, um, when I'm talking with this guy, because he's actually walking us back to, I guess, like their workplace, um, it's the first time since we've been in China when my missus has no clue what's going on. All the other times I was going, what are you saying? What are you saying when she's speaking Chinese to like her friends and also people that she's meeting? She's like, I don't, a silent, silent, I'm, I, you know, I'm busy right now. And so at this point, it was finally me doing it to her because I was like, oh, be quiet, be quiet. I'm speaking to an Esperanto speaker right now. 
Anyway, he took me up into, I think it was the headquarters for Cina Radio Internazio. I was only there for an hour, mind you. Um, and he introduced me to like five other people. It was like their lunch break and they're all West Prime speakers. And it, it seemed like they had all gone to university type of thing. And they're all like different editors and stuff like that. And it was, it was really, really a fascinating event. Like the, this was my first ever international meeting with Esperanto. And it was kind of just like thrown together at the last moment type of thing. And it was really interesting because I asked them, why did you study Esperanto at uni? And they're like, well, for the job opportunities. And I was like, what job opportunities? And they told me, everyone in China studies English. They have to, basically. But very few can actually speak English at the end. Like, barely anyone ever actually completes an English course. Or well, they complete the course, but they're never actually able to speak the language. And that's true, because I met so many people who are like, yeah, I studied English at school. They're telling my missus this in Chinese, and then they can say hello to me in English, and that's about it. But at the end of the course, they're saying, when they first came into uni, and they, they, they sat down like at some type of meeting or something, um, there was two people there, and one of them goes, you can study English. And that will help you get jobs. But there's no guarantee you'll get a job because there's so much competition. And most of the competition is actually from foreigners. So you've got to basically go up against them. Good luck with that because they've got perfect accents. They're English speakers. Or you can do what this guy recommends, speak Esperanto and be guaranteed a job at the end of this course because they're desperate for Esperanto speakers at the government agencies that support Esperanto because there's actually several different groups that, you know, have, um, like that support Esperanto, especially within the Beijing area. So they were basically guaranteed a job if they just completed the Esperanto course and they completed the courses, they got jobs. Um, one of them was, um, one of them had been there for like 15 years and it was really, it was like really, really fascinating because it was a fully professional atmosphere and Esperanto speakers. It was like, it was all work related and all that. They weren't, like most of them that I spoke to, weren't actually idealistic in any form. Um, for them, it was just something that they had to do for their career. Um, they enjoyed the language. They loved it, the fact that they could, you know, get a job out of this type of thing. But it was a very different type of atmosphere. It was more like Esperanto is a career path rather than a hobby language like we would treat it here in Australia because the government just, they don't give two hoots about Esperanto in Australia. So it was very different. And they actually even offered me a job at one point. They're like, you know, we're actually looking for someone to come work here for, I think it was like six months or something, um, within the, the editing department or something. Um, you seem like a good enough Esperanto speed. Do you want to work here? And I was like, oh, oh. my missus is a Chinese, but we just brought a house back in Australia. So there's no way I was going to be able to do that. But anyway, I just thought I'd share that little bit with you and one last thing I went to um, the Forbidden City which is actually called the purple city in um, Chinese because it's actually like purple like it's painted so we call it the Forbidden City but they call it the purple city um, and in Esperanto it's also called La Pupura Urubo um, so we went there we walked through it and it's freaking massive like so massive you can spend a day there and not see everything we come out the other end there's this little tourism booth okay and I walk past it, not even thinking, and I kind of stop and I look over, and there's like these little electronic guides you can get, and they're in all sorts of languages. And I, I was joking to my missus, I was like, ha, ah, wonder if there's an Esperanto one. I walked over, and there there was. There was a freaking Esperanto electronic guide. So if you ever go to the Forbidden City in China, go to the tourist stand and get yourself an electronic guide in Esperanto, because I didn't get one. Yep. I went through the whole freaking city, came out the other end, and then realized that they have an electronic guide in freaking Esperanto. So I was highly disappointed about that fact because I had to go the next day. Anyway, so that was just my random video blog about what I'm reading at the moment. Uh, my fascination, my newfound fascin fascination with Omoto. Um, my experience with Esperanto in China, my randomly thrown together experience. That all basically happened in like a two hour period, so it's not really that much to tell you about. But yeah, so if you've liked this video, give it a like, share it around with your friends, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and I promise tomorrow I'll have a video game um, slash Esperanto lesson or whatever for you guys. So see you then, and if you're not there, you know what happens, I find you, and I do bad things to you. <laughs> yeah.